Bell's Persia by Jerry Payton. Phonograph Cylinder One, The Odd at Sea. The events of mid-December 1866 slap me right in the knickknacks. Although much time has passed, the memories still smart, as do my knickknacks. A complete innocent, I was the proverbial cat with a firework up its backside. My fuse lit, I was totally unaware of the shock to follow. Who's a pretty boy? Well, hopefully I am. Geoffrey, embrace me. Certainly, darling. <coughs> Celia, there's something down south that needs attending to. I know it's pressing against me. No, down south as in London. Oh, I thought... That's I'm... my pocket chronometer. Why London? I've received a letter. Well, we've all received one of those, darling. I have an interview. There's an available position in Persia, with the telegraph department. The staff need a medical officer. We can bring forward our wedding and start a new life out there. But darling, we live in Cheshire, not Persia. It'll be an adventure. And staying here would also be an adventure. We could learn to play croquet on the lawn. Daddy says it's all the rage. Your daddy has nothing but rages these days. All the more reason to leave. He's taken against me since our engagement. Nonsense. Only the other day he said he'd like to see you settled here. Your father said that? Well, he said he'd like to see cold earth heaped upon your remains. But it was obvious what he meant. I'm sorry, Celia. I've no future here. The population of Ramshaft is shrinking. But can't you find a position closer to home? I mean, really, Geoffrey. Who wants to live in Worcestershire? You're thinking of Pershaw. Persia is in Asia. Near Prestwick? No, that's Ayrshire. Look, Celia, I'm a newly qualified doctor. The only way I can make my fortune is by going overseas. Just think, I might assist a grand vizier. You don't know any magic tricks. Everything will be fine. No harm attending the interview, hey, sweetie? Now, how about giving my chronometer a polish? <sighs> Ah, you must be the doctor, chap. Geoffrey Bell? That's right, Colonel Grant. Call me, Colonel. Forgive me for not shaking your hand. London's infected with cholera. Really? I thought that business had passed. Be seated. Take that document from my desk and read through it. Certainly, Colonel. Not with your hands. Use the tongs. Uh, tongs? Yes, tongs. During times of plague or cholera, all correspondence must be handled with laundry tongs can't be too careful. Yes, Colonel, but I haven't heard anything about... When you've lived in the tropics as long as I have, you recognise the signs. Here, use my pair. Um, thank you, Colonel. As you can see, everything you need to know is outlined in the report. I'm having a spot of bother turning the pages. Just sign the attached contract. Um, I haven't reached that bit yet. Come on, man, I haven't got all day. I've got supplies to organise for our journey. You're coming too? Haven't you read the report? Well, no. <sighs> You'll travel ahead of me to Vienna, where we'll meet up. From there, we'll push on to Constantinople, then to Persia by way of Russia. Are you picking your nose? No, I'm just tweezing some nostril hairs with the tongs. Oh, stop. It's distracting. Once we get to Tehran, you'll travel alone to Hamadan. Nice place, about 200 miles west of Tehran. You'll be billeted at the local telegraph office. And my wife? Wife? You didn't mention anything about a wife in your letter. Well, we're not married yet, Colonel. I should hope not. Filthy business. Celia and I are engaged. I mean, it's unnatural, isn't it? We thought we could bring forward our wedding and Celia would follow once I'm settled in Persia. Out of the question, man. Persia is no fit place for a lady. Besides, the travel alone would kill her. Might even kill us. Really? You're still young, Belle. Plenty of fish in the sea. Plenty of effluent. You're the only chap to have applied for this position. I'm beginning to see why. Take two days, no more mind. Then, when you've come to your senses, return and sign at the bottom of the page. Wife, indeed. The following morning 
I received word from Celia that she was willing to follow me to Persia. In light of the dangers that lay ahead, there was only one course of action open to me. I signed the contract with the telegraph department and hoped for the best. The first leg of my journey was much like a nighttime knuckle dance attempted twice in a row. Frantic motion with barely any sleep. Though I did have some rest in Vienna. Until the colonel arrived with his prized possession in tow... Isn't this chest a little on the small side to be of use, Colonel? It's to house something quite valuable, though it's empty now. It's magnificently nobbled. Hand-carved in India, hence the elephants. Quite novel how they form a chain, trunks holding on to tails. Those aren't tails, they're love flutes. Ah, yes. You're looking handsome tonight, Belle. Why don't you join me for a nightcap? Um, I couldn't possibly, Colonel. Early start tomorrow. Play your cards right, and the contents of that chest could be yours. You just said it was empty. For now. So how about that nightcap? A little tipple before dormitory billiards? Sorry? You know, dormitory billiards. Like at school. A bit of back and forth with the hand along the old pink queue, hmm? Oh, gosh, I, I see. I'll leave you to it, then. Shame, I was rather hoping you'd join in. I'm sorry, Colonel, but that won't be happening. I I'm rather tired. Uh, oh, um, good night. You can use the tongs. I don't mind. In the morning, I received a rude awakening. And after my cream stick had wilted, I received yet another rude awakening. Well, why won't this door open? Uh, one moment. There's a chest of drawers in front of it. Whatever for? Afraid I was going to bugger you during the night? No, of course not, Colonel. I, um, was worried about thieves. Thieves? In a hotel of this calibre? You're more likely to be buggered by me. By jiggers, you're not even dressed. I overslept. Overcome by the strain of travel. That and the strain of the stool. Forget about the chest of drawers. The stench in here is enough to keep thieves at bay. I haven't yet emptied my chamber pot. Bit of an upset tummy in the night. Upset? Livid, aren't they? And I'll be livid when I catch up at the hotel chef. I knew that pork chop was undercooked. Forget about him. The whole matter is a tempest in a teapot. Or chamber pot in your case. We don't have time for retribution. We depart in an hour, by horse or steam. Horse. I don't think I can take any more steam this morning. You really should have emptied your chamber pot. We pushed onwards, though frankly I'd had quite enough of pushing thanks to the pork chop. Constantinople provided another welcome rest. Such a magnificent city. The sights, smells and colours, and that was just the latrines. The colonel was furtive, spending lengthy periods in meetings. His constant habit of fondling my knee meant that I avoided him. I explored the streets and bazaars, employing a guide called Altan, though sometimes his company was as welcome as rectal seepage after a thorough cough. Splendid performance, Altan. We have a similar puppet show in England called Punch and Judy. Tell me, what were the crowd chanting at the end of the performance? Death to the infidel, death to the Englishman. Really? But you joined in with them. It's nothing. Ah, here we are at my favourite coffee house. You want to be shaved? A shave in a coffee house? It's really a barber's, but it serves the best coffee in town. Tastes that good, huh? No, it's disgusting, but still is the best coffee in town. Perhaps we'll forego the coffee. What's he like as a barber? He is the best in town. That good, huh? Well, needs must. My razor is blunt and I'd like a shave before leaving for Russia. Unlike you Musulmans, I prefer not to wear the beard. You have the face of a lady. Oh, don't you start. I get enough of that from the colonel. Ah, Belle, you're late. 
I said two o'clock in the hotel lobby. And why are you wearing that ridiculous hat on your head? It's a fez, Colonel. You're not getting native on me, are you? Take it off. Yes, Colonel. My grief, you're bald. I had a bit of bother at the barber's. A bit of bother? You're as bare as a baby's bonds. I only wanted my hair neatened. But apparently, Musulmans shave their heads before embarking on a journey. So now I'm bold. Why ever didn't you stop him? I tried, but Altam was rather slow in translating. Damn foreigners. They never get the hang of English. They'll be expecting us to learn their languages next. By the time my request to desist had been conveyed to the barber, my hair had vanished, along with the indignity. You should never have bought that fez. We'll sort you out with more suitable headwear along the way. We're to leave soon, then. Yes, my special trunk is now occupied. Have you tried eating stewed prunes? That should shift you. We travelled by steamer along the Turkish coast of the Black Sea, then all the way to Tehran in a rickety open wagon. Much like a school matron's helping hand, it was a right bone shaker, but did the job. Tehran wasn't that impressive. The exteriors of Persian houses belied the opulence of their interiors, however, and our lodgings were decidedly better than the staging posts we'd been accustomed to. We spent the night in the apartments of Captain Theobald Roger, who, like a pocket soldier, needed to attention, provided welcome comfort. So, Belle, you're the way to hammer down here? That's right, Roger. I... Ah, Belle, slight change of plan. You're now to be stationed outside of Hamadan, in a village called Hell. Hell? Don't worry, it has a completely different meaning in Farsi. Which is? No idea. Still, it's only a little way out of town, so you won't feel too isolated. I'm to lodge by myself? Heavens, no, you'll have Charlie by your side. Charlie? The regimental cat. Better than nothing, I suppose. What does he eat? You don't have to worry about that. Charlie died ten years ago. We had him stuffed and mounted. Don't look so alarmed. I'm sure you'll receive plenty of visitors. But what's Bill to do there? I thought he was here to look after our engineers. And he will tend to them, if need be. But they're a hardy lot. No, Bell. You ought to be the personal physician of Prince Farrokh, a member of the Persian royal family. Wowza. Sorry? Ah, um, wowza. It's a colloquial thing in Ramshaft. <sighs> All very political. You become Prince Farrokh's physician, and the Telegraph Department gains unimpeded access to various tribal lands. We're at odds with these tribes? No, they're just very odd with us. They behave like simpletons to a nervous. They think it gives them the upper hand during negotiations. Total nightmare to deal with. Have you ever seen grown men dribble? I've been to the House of Lords. Anyway, we depart in a fortnight. You're coming with me? Only as far as Hamadan. Roger, too. Really? Yes, really. That's your new posting. There's a problem with corruption there. The superintendent is an exceptional fellow. I can safely say you'll find no corruption under his command. Precisely, that's the problem. The locals thrive on corruption. There simply isn't enough of it. It's causing unease. So, who better to feather some nests than one of the most unscrupulous men in the British Army? Really, Colonel, I must protest. Spare me the histrionics, Roger. You're well known for taking bribes. Look at this place. It's like you've ransacked the British Museum. As for you, Belle, you'll be on your own for the last leg of your journey, and by then you'll be on your last legs. Don't listen to him. There's little between Hamadan and Hell, literally and metaphorically. Two weeks later, we departed. We travelled post-haste, eventually arriving in Hamadan by cover of night. The next morning, we rose early. But then such is a man's leather stretcher at that time of day. After breakfast, I bid a temporary farewell to Roger, the colonel having made himself conspicuously absent. There's no way of breaking this tear, gently, old chap. The colonel's been sitting on this letter since London. It does look rather rumpled. It was addressed to you, care of the colonel. He opened it by mistake. Darling Geoffrey, terrible news. 
Daddy has died. Or rather unexpected, considering he'd only stubbed his toe. But Father had slipped away by the end of the afternoon. I'm sorry, Geoffrey. I can't possibly leave England now. The sole heir I'm to run the estate. Besides, I've asked around and Persia sounds ghastly. They don't even play croquet. Oh, and I'm afraid our engagement is off. It was Daddy's dying wish that I marry a Welshman. I think he may have been delirious by that point. But I'll give him the benefit of the doubt. Poor Daddy. Chin up, Celia. Roger, that's uncanny. You sound just like her. But why wasn't I told about this letter? You'd never have survived the journey. The Colonel thought you'd be too upset. Of course I'm upset. Naturally, you've lost the love of your life. It's not that. Where am I going to find another girl with suction like hers? Much like one's trousers eggs after a long journey in the saddle, I felt crushed. The only consolation was that I would soon make my fortune. My baggage was sent ahead and I left Hamadan on foot. This wasn't at all treacherous. I was greeted by two of the prince's men shortly after leaving. Like dockside doxes touting for business, they stood waiting by the roadside, ready to take me all the way to hell. All right, Jack. Habib's the name accompanying's my game. Good heavens! Who taught you English, Habib? The missionary, Reverend Sprague. Nice chap. Uh, from the Midlands, by any chance? From Esfahan. Nah, British like you. Do others from your village speak English? Most of us. We learned because the Reverend couldn't get the hang of Farsi. The Reverend Sprague? Uh, a missionary, you say? So you're converts to Christianity? Hardly. I'm a Zoroastrian. Ah, yes, I've read about you. I didn't know I was so infamous. No, I meant... Oh, never mind. So will I be lodging with Reverend Sprague? No, I'm afraid he's dead. All very tragic. Oh, dear. How exactly did he meet his end? Crucifixion. They crucify people here. It was about two months ago, wasn't it, Amjad? <gasps> You'll have to excuse him nodding like that. He's been mute since birth. Anyway, it was a good turnout, and the kids seemed to enjoy it. That's the main thing. Hell was a tiny village comprising a cluster of traditional houses. Alongside them stood Reverend Sprog's mission, built by his own hand in the European style. Now derelict, the mission, much like a merkin for a displaced louse, was to be a home of sorts for the foreseeable future. I unpacked, and late in the afternoon had my first audience with the Prince. Excuse me, good man, is this the home of Prince Farrokh? It is. Do you want your shoes cleaned? I suppose they are a little dirty. If you call that goat's muck on your soul, a little. Ah, I, I didn't see that. Must be a bit of a hazard for you country folk. That and bumping into Englishmen with dung on their shoes. Certainly doesn't make my job any easier. I must say, the prince's abode is rather disappointing. I mean, I'm going to have to soak this brush after doing this. Barely bigger than the surrounding houses. There you go, cock. Oh, spick and span. Here, keep the change. Now, my name is Dr. Geoffrey Bell. Kindly inform the prince I've arrived. You're looking at him? Sorry? Prince Farrakh, at your service. But you just cleaned my shoes. I've got to make a living somehow, mate. You're the royal. Don't you get an allowance? Hardly. Living here is my punishment. I'm a disgraced royal. Disgraced? I was caught cheating at cards. Oh, cheating at cards is indeed dishonourable. You'd be ostracised in my country too. Oh no, cheating wasn't the problem. Everyone cheats at cards, even the Shah. I was caught cheating. That was my disgrace. A good cheat is never discovered. In that case, your punishment seems rather harsh. I also threw up over the Shah's feet during an audience with him, which didn't help. Dodgy kebab, if you ask me. That's why I clean shoes for a living. I thought it a fitting punishment. I see. Well, I believe I'm to be your personal physician. I've no need of your services. Constitution of an ox, me. Or be it an ox with swollen knees, backache and the occasional bout of hemorrhoids. So why am I here? My cousin, the Shah, sent an envoy to check up on me. 
He would report you back saying I had a melancholic air about me. And needed a physician? You do seem melancholic. Wouldn't you if you lived here? Well, I do live here now. You signed up to be posted to this godforsaken hovel. Ha! Huh. They saw you coming. Surely it can't be that bad. Your predecessor didn't fare too well. The Reverend wasn't my predecessor. I may be lodging at the mission, but I'm only here in my capacity as a doctor. Glad to hear it. Nice chap, the Reverend, but always banging on about Christianity. I had to hide behind the curtain every time he came knocking. His faith didn't do him much good in the end, though. He met a terrible fate. You witnessed his crucifixion. I commissioned the cross. You did what? That was a lovely cross. Even if I say so myself. You rarely see wood as fine as that. A gentle, decent man crucified for preaching his faith, and you commissioned his cross. You as good as hammered the nails in yourself. Whoa, it wasn't like that. We didn't use nails, we used rope. Besides, the Reverend asked us to crucify him. Pull the other one. His crucifixion was symbolic. He was reenacting the suffering of Jesus. He wanted to win over Armenian Christians to his denomination. Not that it would have worked. Why ever not? The village doesn't have any Armenian Christians. Bit of a misunderstanding on the Reverend's part. So what happened at the crucifixion? While he was up there on the cross, the Reverend was struck by lightning. Unfortunate business, but pretty spectacular. He went up like a Roman candle. Oh, well, I do hope this little misunderstanding hasn't soured our relationship. After all, we still have the matter of my wages to discuss. Wages? Look, there's no polite way round this. If you don't have two brass farthings to rub together, how am I to be paid? You get a salary from the telegraph department, don't you? Only a pittance. That's not what I heard. Besides, a pittance goes a long way here. It can buy a lot of kebabs. Well, whatever you paid, you better get used to it, because my pockets are empty. Listen, I've left my fiancé, endured treacherous roads, suffered the indignity of having my head shaved, and as for my tummy, it hasn't settled since Vienna. I came here to make my fortune. In that case, you'll be pleased with what arrived for you this morning. Habib, right you are. My word, it's the colonel's chest. He said I could have it if I pleased him. Must have been that time when I sat on his lap at the theatre in Stamboul. I'll leave you to your good fortune. Here you go, Jock Bell. Well, hurry up. Remove the lid. I... I don't know what to say. I do. Why is there a stuffed cat in this box? Damn! Bell's Persia was produced and performed by me, Jerry Payton. If you need to contact me, email bellspersia at gmail.com. Or one word, just leave out the apostrophe. And you can follow me on Twitter at bell underscore persia. Here, yeah, pussy pussy, come to Daddy Charlie. No, it's just not the same.